Welcome to Photoactive, a podcast about photography and technology. I'm Kirk McElhern. And I'm Jeff Carlson. You can find show notes, including any photos we discuss in this episode at photoactive.co. That's photoactive.co. So we're going to do an episode that's a bit (laughs) touchy-feely. Retouchy-feely. Retouchy-feely, because we're going to talk about retouching photos. In fact, we're going to have two episodes about retouching. The first one is... I would say the neophyte's guide to retouching. So that's Jeff and me. And in the second one, we're going to have a guest who is a professional retoucher, compositor, um, does complicated photos from movies and TV shows and does advertising and, and the real stuff. So retouching, you know, it's something I don't do a lot. So this is one of the episodes where Jeff is going to do most of the talking. Let me talk about the retouching that I do. It's very limited. Um, last week, I wrote a review of the new Apple Watch. And for the website in question, I needed to take a couple of photos of the Apple Watch. I set up my um, Fujifilm X-T3 on a tripod, and I did a a shot of the watch on my wrist, you know, that typical um, wrist watch shot that we have been seeing for years since the um, Apple Watch came out. And then I did another one with the Apple Watch and its band just flat on my desk. And I have one of those new solo loop bands. So it kind of looks like a ring. And in both of those photos, there were things I needed to retouch. Um, I needed to retouch little dust spots. I needed to retouch little reflections on the the glass case of the Apple Watch that looked disturbing, that they were real reflections, but they just didn't look right. I select the photo, I go into edit mode, I look for the retouch tool, and I click the little brush icon, and it makes a little circle, and I click on the dust spot. And that's about the extent of my retouching, and I know that you can do so much more. So, Jeff, what can you do with retouching? Retouching is kind of a loaded word. When I think of retouching, I think of augmenting portraits. You're doing wedding photos, you're uh, doing like some very sophisticated compositing. Like like that's what I think of when I think of retouching. But there's also the retouching like you just mentioned, which is there's some spots in the sky or there was some dust on your sensor. There was some, you know, some little bit that just doesn't belong there that you want to get rid of and you want to get rid of easily. And pretty much all of the software programs will do some sort of retouching to various degrees. And that's what we're going to cover here. Mostly just the things that, that you can do quite easily. You don't have to have any special skills or special training. Um, I have a few examples that I'm going to show. Um, we're going to work a little bit in the Photos app, in Lightroom app, and um, maybe you know dip our toes a little bit into Photoshop, although even though... Really? I know, I know, I know. It's it's That's like even more... More advanced, but... Does Photoshop have that thing where you can, like, remove a person from a photo and not notice that they were ever there? To some extent, yes. For our purposes and our audience, just sort of making an assumption here, most of what you're going to do is you're just going to remove distracting things because we're talking about composition. And every once in a while, you'll get a shot. Like, maybe you have, like I said, dust spots in the sky, or maybe... You know, if you've done any landscape photography, invariably, like, there's the little bit of tree branch that just sticks out into the sky. You know, you could crop in, but maybe that ruins what you want. Yeah. If, you, if you can just zip, get rid of it, that's the best way to go. And in some cases, it's actually quite easy. A branch in the sky is pretty simple because the sky is a uniform color. Um, a dust spot on anything. So when I've done close-up macro shots of flowers, there's often a dust spot or even a little bug that I didn't notice when I was shooting it. And those are pretty easy too, because it's it's an isolated area where there's not a lot going on behind Mm -hmm. it. It gets a lot more complicated if you're shooting something that's very busy, where the colors change, where the contrast changes. So how about some examples, Jeff? Okay. So first example, um, I've got this this pier. um, And oh, I, I should also mention before we start, if you are using a podcast player that supports it, like uh, Apple Podcasts or Overcast, there's a feature where the images that we're talking about, we can embed those in the podcast and you can view that on the app. Obviously, you don't want to be doing this if you're driving. And also, if you're listening on your iPhone, the images are going to be really small. Um, yeah. So they'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. But if we're talking about details, you'll really want to wait until you go back home and go to the website, photoactive.co, where you'll see the photos and you'll be able to click on them to zoom them and all that. 
Exactly. We found this to be very helpful and uh, we're quite surprised we had a discussion in the Photoactive Facebook group where there were some people who didn't even know that this was a possibility. And in an earlier episode when we were really talking about uh, the photos that we had taken during August, it was very helpful for people to be able to see exactly what we were talking about. So uh, be sure to check that out if you haven't. And um, in the meantime, we'll try to explain as best we can for somebody who doesn't have the opportunity to take a look at, at these as you're listening. So the photo that I'm looking at right now uh, was taken in Hawaii. It's, it's a beach and a pier. It's a blue sky with just a couple of little uh, clouds in the sky. And you look at it at first and you think, oh, it's lovely. It's nice. And then what happens is the details start popping out. And so, for example, in the uh, sort of upper fifth of the image, there's a little uh, dust spot. Now, it's, it's worth noting that Jeff is sharing his screen with me so I can see what he's doing. This means that I will be able to perhaps mention things based on exactly what I'm seeing. You can be like a sports commentator describing the action. And Jeff has just zoomed in, and now we've got the little cursor coming up to the top, and it's getting near the top, and he's zooming in, and he's winding up, and... <laughs> this might be a complete failure. Um, it might. But, but that's okay. And now he's just switched to edit mode? <laughs> what I can do in the Photos <laughs> app, uh, there's basically a, a retouch tool. I have set the size of this tool, and I've just clicked once on the spot to get rid of the spot. Now, what's probably difficult for Kirk to see, or even for anybody uh, looking at this, if they were standing over my shoulder, is that spot wasn't really noticeable. I Things didn't like see that. It. Oh, you didn't now, see it at all? No, not at all. Now, you have to understand the resolution of the screen sharing here is quite low. Well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah, it's it's not a spot. It's a blotch. It's like a big blotch in the sky. It's a little and, blotch. And it looks to me like maybe you had touched your lens or something or your filter. Yes. Okay. There was just something on the lens, right? I hadn't yeah. cleaned it correctly. Okay. And so this kind of points to one of the problems of doing this is you may not see these things that are in the sky. In fact, there's another one uh, a little bit down further uh, to the right from that. Now, there are a couple of different ways to do it. If you pump up your contrast, that would make those more visible. But then, of course, you're making edits that perhaps you don't want to make. Um, another quick, easy way to try to find things like this, if you zoom in, you just move the image, so you pan around the image, the spots become much more visible. Okay, but now I need to point something out. You don't make the tool the size of the spot. You need to make the tool much larger than the spot. Yes. Because the tool actually, I don't know if the term is, is feathered when you're talking about the way a brush has fall off or something. It is, yes. Um, the tool works most in the center, but near the edges it doesn't work. And now you can see this if you click the tool on something where there's a border. So for instance, if you make the tool big the way it was before and you click it on the bit um, of the pier where the pier meets the sky, um, you'll see how much actually gets retouched. Um, mm -hmm. Not... It, the, the edges don't get retouched that much. And I learned this early on because I would be trying to retouch something right next to the edge of something. And so I'd click so it was just the edge of the circle over it and I would notice nothing happened. And I realized that you need to make the, the reticule or the little circle um, probably about twice the size of the, the spot, if not more. Um, to be able to get rid of it. Yeah. What I'm going to show real quick, here's a really easy one. Um, it looks like I had a, a spot on my sensor, like maybe a bit of dust on my sensor. And so in the water underneath the pier, there's just a, a red dot. Yeah. And so what I can do is I can just click on that. And now, unfortunately, sometimes what happens is uh, you do that and it, depending on the tool... You're, the result may not be that great. Photos has just kind of made a big smudge out of it because yeah. this was in an area where there was some some surf coming. And this is where you might get a little frustrated because something like Photos, it can do some of the work, but your results will definitely vary depending on tool. Try to make the circle about twice the size of the spot, no bigger than that. All right, so then if I do that... 
So, so what just happened is interesting. It didn't do anything. It didn't um, do anything. So you need to make it bigger. And I've noticed that, that if it's too small, there's not enough of a, a hot spot in the center. So in this case, just the retouch tool by itself has not really done anything. It's actually made it worse. It looks like someone has just kind of put their thumb on that little spot. That would annoy me. So I'm going to try one more thing in photos. And this is actually kind of a brilliant way of kind of smashing together two tools. So one way is to use uh, something like like this retouch tool. Um, in other programs, it's called the like the healing brush or the healing tool. And a more traditional way uh, before a lot of these tools came in was to clone and stamp. And cloning and stamping means you're basically taking pixels from one nearby area and then putting them onto the part that you want to fix. The Photos app doesn't really have clone and stamp. But what it does have is when you select the retouch button, if you option click, that lets you specify a source area. And so then you option click to say, this is where I want my source to be. And then you click again. And what it will do is basically copy those pixels from the nearby area. And now when I've gotten rid of, of my little red spot there, even though I can tell it's been lifted from the nearby section, uh, nobody would ever notice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can also do this by dragging the circle. So if you do that, um, let's say um, a good example here would be you, you're zoomed in on one of the pillars of the pier and there's a white spot on it. And it's not a white spot of the photo. It's just a white spot on the concrete. Yeah. So if you were to option click on the left, um, let's say on, on the other side of the pier, yeah, around there, and then if you were to drag up like draw with the circle from below to above, what it's going to do is it's going to copy the whole bit from where you clicked up and down, right? So you just got rid of that white spot and it looks totally natural. Yes. Um, it's not just copying the place where you clicked, but it's using that as the starting point for what it copies. So you can draw out a whole area. Let's say you've got something you've got a shot of something on grass. You want to get a dog out of the grass, right? And if you click someplace else on the grass, assuming the light's similar, the color's similar, mm -hmm. you can just draw over the dog and it won't look perfect, but it will kind of look like the grass is real. Yeah. And and I think there's definitely some artistry to that and some practice, especially if you're going to do do that, but you can absolutely get pretty good results. All right, so that's that's like a quick version of, of using the Photos app. Now, I want to switch to Lightroom because Lightroom has a nice tool, and this applies to Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Um, I have a picture here of a tree at sunset. Again, a very clear sky. Um, <laughs> clear skies are great for finding dust spots and gunk on your lens because they yeah. will come up as as spots. Now, as I'm looking at this right now, it looks pretty good. This is unedited or partially edited. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, hey, that's not too bad. Well, now I want to see what the sky looks like. So if I go to the healing brush in Lightroom, there's this great little checkbox that says visualize spots. And when I click visualize spots, it gives me a super high contrast inverted version of the image. And in the sky, you can see, I can zoom in, are basically like, it looks like a bunch of, um, uh, you know, moon craters. Yeah. And these moon craters are basically the spots in the sky. So if I turn the visualize spots off, then you can see that that little uh, ghost of an image. And it turns out that on this picture, my lens was very dirty. That's really interesting. I didn't know that something like that existed. Yeah, it's it's very, very helpful. And so um, here again, I'm with, with the healing brush in Lightroom and I make the size of the brush a little bit bigger than the item itself. And then when I click that, what it's doing is it's sampling a nearby area and Lightroom kind of shows you which area it's sampling from and you can drag that that sample area. So for example, it, if it automatically grabs a section that might include, you know, part of your foreground or something, you can adjust that really easily. Or it might include another spot. Or it might include another spot, absolutely. And, and also it's manipulatable so you can make that a little bit larger. Then I can just go through and 
hit all these different spots just to get rid of them. And you know, the nice thing about this kind of uh, editing is it's not really going to take a lot of time. Obviously, you know, when we're here describing it, it takes more time. But you don't have to just assume that, oh, I've got spots in my sky, so this image is ruined. I can just, you know, literally just take a few minutes and... But look at all of them. Oh, oh, I know. This, I, I specifically got this, this image because I love the image, and it, it wasn't until later that I realized I was just completely derelict in getting in, into the spot without cleaning my lens. This is the, hello, how to be embarrassed as a photographer who likes to think that he actually <laughs> you know, knows something. But that's what happens, right? We go out and we try to do the best we can. Okay, here's a really good example. It's taken some of these tree branches in an attempt to yeah. fix it. So what's happened right now is I've tried to fix a spot and what the healing brush does, it has, has two modes. So it has a healing mode. And what it's trying to do is pull images, pull pixels from nearby areas. Well, part of this area that needs to be fixed includes part of the tree. And so it doesn't really know what to do. And so it's it's grabbed some of that color from the tree. So now it just looks like there's a big uh, blob out in front of the, uh, like out in the sky. So sort of like photos in, in this way, the healing brush in Lightroom also has a clone mode. And what the clone mode says, okay, rather than trying to apply my own healing algorithms to it, I'm just going to copy the pixels that you've specified from another area. It's worth noting, we talked about photos before. Um, it's very possible that shortly after this episode of Photoactive is released, macOS uh, Big Sur will be released. Oh, yeah. And um, I haven't actually tried this in the betas, but uh, on Apple's Big Sur feature list, they talk about an improved retouch tool that now uses advanced machine learning to remove blemishes, dust specks, and other objects from a photo. From what I've seen in the beta, and it's been a little bit spotty, haha. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, listeners. It looks like the tool works the same in terms of how you yeah, use it. But that's what it looked like to me, yeah. But the results are hopefully going to be better. So what about an app like Luminar? Does it have anything like that? I'm, I've just opened a photo in Luminar, and I can't find where it would be. In Luminar, there's a canvas button. There's an erase tool and a separate clone and stamp tool. Yeah, okay. So I just tried this on a photo, and it, the clone and stamp is pretty much the same as in Lightroom, mm -hmm. but the way it works is a bit clunky. It kind of goes into a separate window. It does. And then you apply it, then you have to click done. So it's not doing it in real time. And uh, where we were, where we or I was watching in Lightroom, you click and it was working automatically. Yeah, the way Luminar approaches it, it it's kind of its own separate little mode. And um, on one hand, the advantage is you can uh, basically like go and, and hit all your spots that you want to fix and then have it be fixed. So... You know, what Lightroom is doing, it's kind of doing everything on the fly. Uh, Luminar, um, the tool, I don't think is as uh, optimized as they would like. And so rather than trying to do everything, you know, after click, 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 they let you select all the areas that you want to fix and then you click the erase button and then it does the fix. An early version of Luminar, the erase tool was... Uh, I dare say, pretty useless. Mm. The new one, so Luminar 4, is actually much better. And this actually brings me to another thing that you would want to do when you're retouching, which is just getting rid of objects that you don't want to be there. Right. So that's why I said, well, you can get rid of a person. Um, in this case, in this example, I have a, a picture of a person. This is a, a photo of my daughter in a, a rare snowstorm last year. And I like the picture of her. She's wearing a knitted hat. But when you zoom in on the hat, there are basically some like tree leaves or something that had fallen on the hat. So what I can do in Luminar is I can click the erase tool. We're just going to resize the brush and I'm going to paint over the leaves that are right there. Now, before I click the the erase button the problem with this kind of a photo is 
what the the software will try to do is grab uh, pixels near it, or it'll try to fill in with pixels of the same color. And in fact, I'm going to do this real quick in photos, just as a as a good example of of how it doesn't work very well. So in photos, if I zoom in, so you're trying to get rid of what a little little bit of grass or something in her hat. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I click the retouch button. I'm going to drag over the spot where the leaves are. And what Photos does... Oh, yeah. It makes a blur. It makes a blur. And it's it's like pulled... I don't know. There's a weird streak. I mean, it's 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 actually worse than, than what I had started with. Okay. Go back. Instead of dragging, option click and now just click on it. That Okay. That's not bad. It's not bad. If you zoom out, that's that's acceptable, I'd say. Possibly, yeah. But with photos for something like this, you kind of have to get lucky if it's complicated. Exactly. You kind of have to try a number of times to get the right spot. Well, and you have to, especially for something like this that's patterned, you have yeah. to you know, make sure you're, you're matching up different areas. And if you want to do that, that's great. But I would much rather, so I'm switching back to Luminar, and when I click erase on this this area here... It actually wow. makes okay. it look as if those leaves were never there. It's it's putting enough smarts to it where the the pattern is still the same. It's basically just gotten rid of it without any artifact that tells you that um, the you know that that there was anything there. So this is definitely a case of you may have something that you want to fix in photos and it doesn't quite do the job. So maybe you want to open it in something else. So maybe you have yeah. Luminar, maybe you have um, Pixelmator Pro, something like that. So Pixelmator Pro has a healing tool and has a clone and stamp tool. So I'll be interested to see what it can do with this specific photo here. Okay, so here's the same photo in Pixelmator Pro. We're gonna zoom in on that area. Their tool is called the repair tool. It's done wow. a really good job too. That's excellent. That is excellent. And that's not even the clone in stamp where you might even get better results by cloning a bit lower on the hat. Given if you just, if you were to zoom out to the normal size that you'd look at this photo, you wouldn't know that that's there. It, it would almost look like maybe there's just a little bit of snow in the hat blurring a little bit. Yeah. I mean, quite honestly, even at 100%, if I did not know that I had just made that adjustment, um, yeah. th there's no way I would be able to tell. And this is, yeah. this is something that's got you know, multiple uh, tones of whites and blues, and there's there's water, and this is a fairly sophisticated edit. If you wanted to do this by hand, I think it would take a lot of work. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm seriously impressed, quite honestly. Yeah, so am I. Um, but Pixelmator Pro has been doing some wonderful things. We saw it some time ago um, with, I forget what they call the thing that zooms, that makes photos bigger without making them look too jaggy. Yes. Um, and they keep adding new tools like ML Super Resolution. That's what it's called, ML yes. from Machine Learning. Um, and they keep adding new tools, and it's turning into a really, really powerful app that's leveraging open quote machine learning and artificial intelligence and all that. It's been nice to see a lot of the, the the machine learning and the smarts being applied to something like this, something like retouching, because again, if you know anything about retouching, it's a rabbit hole you can fall into that can get very complicated very quickly. And so I'm going to show two more things before we wrap up, because of course we could do this all day long and uh, <laughs> you... Poor people don't want to hear us <laughs> do this all day long. The photo I have here is an example of something that's just intruding into the frame that's just distracting enough that I don't want it to be here. So this okay, is a wait, photo- Okay, wait, you're going to tell me you can get rid of that stick on the right? I am. Okay. So then this is a photo of my daughter uh, sitting on some rocks next to a creek. And in the lower right-hand corner, there's a branch that just juts from about midway down um, and takes up, you know, literally like the the bottom quarter of the, of the image. Your eye goes directly to her because she's wearing like this this purple uh, sweater, but your eye then just jumps directly to this stick, and so this stick is a problem. Now, if I were to do this in, uh, so what I have here is Lightroom. Um, and I'm going to use the healing brush. 
is try to do healing just to see what happens. And if I drag over this, and this is a, this is a really rough, rough approximation, but basically it's going to look like garbage. You can tell that it's, it's tried to sample from somewhere else. Actually, I'm getting some green from the trees on the other side of the creek. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's garbage. Forget that. But if you are part of the Adobe Industrial Complex, as Kirk <laughs> likes to say, um, if you have Lightroom, then you also have Photoshop, most likely. And if I open this in Photoshop, I go to the healing brush, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to draw over the stick. And what I'm doing is like I'm literally just dragging over the stick. I'm not trying to be too specific about it. I'm there's a little bit of of uh, you know fall off on either side of it. But you know, I'm I'm not having to be super specific. And then when I let go of that, Kirk, what do you think? That's really impressive. Now, you okay. can totally see where it's applied that. And if I wanted to- If you to, know to look for it. If you know to look for it. And I could totally come and maybe use the clone and stamp tool and kind of fix some of these little edges where the stick was. But mm. the content of this helps us in a way because we're looking at some textured rocks. And so there's a lot of texture that can just be kind of reworked in there that you don't notice something's missing. And if you don't know that it was there, you're not going to think that it was there. It's just rocks. Exactly. And that's the advantage of being the editor. You knew it was there, but yeah. anybody who looks at this photo is never going to even suspect that it was there. Okay. Now I want to see that in Pixelmator Pro. All right, Pixelmator Pro. Let's go with your repair brush and see what happens. Uh, it's, that, it's not great. A, oh. It's, it's picked up a lot of, it's picked up some of the, of Near the, the top, it's not great, but the bottom is fine. What I'm doing here is I'm dragging and I'm covering the entire stick all in one pass. Uh, a smarter way to do this would be to do little bits of it. Maybe you do a third of the stick and then a fourth of the stick and whatever, but we're trying to show off here. So we're going to see what happens. Yeah. And that looks great. Yeah. That is comparable to the Photoshop results. Are you using a mouse or a trackpad? I'm using a mouse here. Yeah, and, and what I've found is you, you can't use a trackpad when you need to drag and draw over something that much. You need the precision of a mouse. Yeah, just to satisfy your curiosity, I'm going to go back into Photoshop, which is, again, the best tool for all of this, ultimately. But again, you know, it's, it's Photoshop. It's big, expensive, ongoing, whatever. But Photoshop has always been the best at this kind of thing. I'm going to, just to make Kirk happy, see if we can remove my daughter entirely from this scene <laughs> and see what it does. Now, I am not expecting any good results here, but every once in a while, you can be surprised. And that looks That's terrible. terrible. <laughs> that looks terrible. It's picked up. It's it's put branches and leaves because it's it's getting it from the other side of the river. I think it's cloning it in. Yeah. Um, okay, you went too far. But if you had a dog on grass, then it would take it out. Absolutely. Or, or if she was much smaller in the frame. I mean, she is she is like the yeah. dominant subject in the frame, and so yeah. It can only work with with the pixels that it has. Now yeah. there are other tools. So uh, Photoshop Elements actually has some great tools to be able to, to remove people from a scene. And for example, let's say you're in uh, some sort of tourist destination. There are a lot of people. You want to get a picture and you just don't have the opportunity to get a picture of a, you know, a, a, a shrine or a building that is just it by itself, unless you're there when there are no people. And quite often that's not the case. What you would do then is you would shoot several pictures of the scene, preferably like on a tripod. And what Photoshop Elements can do, it can take those, like let's say you have three pictures and you can specify basically, I want to remove this person from one image and replace them with the same area in another image that's empty. And so you can kind of patch right. together a few right. photos and, and it does a really good job. It's a little bit finicky, but you know, if, if you need to go to that kind of uh, lengths to do some retouching, it is possible. And actually Photoshop Elements is really impressive in that regard. Okay, just before we finish, I'm yeah. going to quickly export a photo I have of Stonehenge. Um, this is when we went to Stonehenge in 2017. I've got a lot of photos and in a lot of them, uh, there are no people. I made sure to get photos with no people. But I've got one photo here 
um, let me just open this with Pixelmator Pro. I've got one photo here where there are some people small um, where they're kind of, you can't really see them, but you can see them. You know what I mean? They're like yeah. in between the rocks. So I'm going to try the repair brush here. And yeah, that's not, okay. It, I think I have to zoom in a little bit more. Um, move this over. So here's a person. I'm just going to draw over this person here. And yeah, that person's pretty much gone. And then this one's pretty much gone. Oops, clicked in the wrong place. Don't want to get rid of the big stones there. <laughs> so here's two people you can just see in between a couple of the stones at the bottom. And behind them, there's sort of a tree line. And that one didn't work quite as well. So it's true that there are some, it really depends on what's in the background, uh, on how the app is deciding which pixels to replace. Um, in this case, it's not ideal, but it's true that um, if you've got, again, dog on a grass, you can get rid of the, the dog on a lawn or on a picnic or something like that, that yeah. sort of thing, where you've got the background um, that's, that's, not not necessarily uniform because grass isn't uniform, but that is uniform enough that the 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 tool is not going to be picking up the branches or other things in the way. Right, right. This is where having texture like that definitely helps. To, you know, like you definitely have an advantage of having a texture that someone looking at the photo, they're not looking at every blade of grass. They're seeing that expanse and seeing, oh, well, that's grass. And so if the texture is not exactly right in some places, unless it really stands out, nobody's going to really notice it. This is also a circumstance where you may end up using multiple tools. You'll use the healing brush to get rid of some of the, the easy people there and then clone and stamp to fix some of the other people that the healing brush didn't didn't catch. I right. Mean, you know, we're, but it depends on how far you want to go. It does. It does depend on how far you want to go. And we're obviously, you know, trying to to do the the most easy, most magical, uh, demo worthy stuff here. And it's entirely likely that maybe you spend 30 minutes fixing an image just because you've got some people or, you know, maybe there's some trash in the foreground, something like that, that you want to get rid of that would otherwise make you think, oh, I can't use this photo because it's got this really distracting thing in it. Okay. So while you were talking there, I took a photo from Avery. Avery is a huge stone circle near Stonehenge. Stonehenge, you can't actually get into the center, and it's relatively compact. Avery is this stone circle. It's maybe a kilometer around. There's part of a village in, in the middle. There's a pub. There's roads going through it. And you can walk around in a lot of places. So I just sent you a photo of a couple of the standing stones. Not an interesting photo at all, um, but you can see that there are a couple of sheep that are very present in front of the standing stones. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to send you the retouched version, which I did in Pixelmator Pro, and you'll notice that you really can't see where the sheep were because they're on the grass. You got rid of the sheep. I got rid of the sheep. Now, not all the ones in the back on the right. I didn't want to go into too much detail. But just to, to talk about the dog on the grass thing I mentioned before, those sheep are gone, and you look at the photo, and there's absolutely no idea that there were sheep before. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is not a photo I even edited at all for contrast or, or color or anything. Um, it was just in my library, and I knew that I had a couple of photos from this area with things that were in the way. Um, and this is quite impressive that you can get rid of something like that. And I think part of what we're getting at today is you don't have to spend a whole lot of time doing this. That something that you might think is a photo that you just couldn't share – you can absolutely spend five minutes, three minutes, two minutes even, and get something that you would be happy to share with somebody else. So one last thing that I want to show, because this also touches on retouching. I said earlier on that when I think of retouching, I think of retouching portraits and uh, fashion and that kind of, of content. Very often, you will want to retouch people in your photos to some extent. Like I said, this is another deep rabbit hole that you can go into. And in the past, it's been something that is really like you have to go watch YouTube videos and find instructions on how to do stuff in Photoshop. And it's just a big, hairy deal. 
that's starting to change. So with Luminar 4, it has basically some portrait retouching tools and they are AI driven. And what that means is it can look at your picture and it can say, oh, there's a face here. So in, in this example, I have a picture of a man. I shot this, this is my friend Rob. When I zoom in, you can see that Rob is a human. Rob has facial hair, he's got wrinkles. His eyes are a little bit dark in this shot. And if I wanted to go and fix this in, say, Photoshop, or um, if I wanted to do, actually, I, I don't think I could really do as much as I would like in photos. I could do some things in Lightroom, but like, for example, his eyes, I want his eyes to pop a little bit more. And so what I would have to do in Lightroom is I'd have to make perhaps some little gradient selections that I could then uh, manually change the tones for and draw those over his eyes. And already I'm just tired of explaining all that because there's so much that is possibly <laughs> involved. So what Luminar will do is when I go to this AI portrait enhancer, because it can recognize that there is a face in the photo, the machine learning also recognizes the parts of the face. So it knows that there are eyes and nose and mouth. And so for example, I can go down to the eye enhancer. There's just a slider that says eye enhancer. And when I drag that up, what it's done is it's brightened his eyes a little bit, added a little bit of contrast and made them pop a little bit. There's a dark circles removal tool. And what that will do is it knows that the sort of shadowy areas underneath your eyes that everybody has, it can brighten those a little bit. Now, with portrait retouching, you know, quite often like you have to make masks, you have to know how to do selections and all that. And this is an example where, you know, software can just make things a lot better. Um, one of the things that I almost always do if I'm editing portraits like this is I want to bring a little bit more light to his face. And there's a face light slider. And so when I increase that, just the area of his face gets lit. And if you have a photo that has maybe four or five different people in it, you have like a family group at a family gathering, you can do face light and it knows that where those faces are and it will just brighten the faces a little bit. So Luminar knows that, for instance, what the face light thing is doing is it's selecting the face and increasing the exposure, basically. Yes, without requiring you to make a selection. Right. And because when you make a selection, you might not select the face perfectly, even though selection tools are, are better and better these days. Yeah. Um, you might slip over or slip under um, right. and, and not get everything that you want. Exactly. Um, and then the last thing I want to show is uh, skin smoothing. So one of the things that, that you want to do uh, in but portraits. That's, what, that's one of the risky areas, isn't it? It is absolutely a risky area. If, yes. If, if the skin is too smooth, it looks like Melania Trump, basically. Yes, exactly. If the skin is too smooth, um, and you know, this has been a problem with with magazine retouching because suddenly you have models who like they they just don't look human, right? Now, I have nothing against age lines, and I never want to get to that sort of mannequin plastic type of look, and especially in a picture like this where he doesn't have a lot of age lines. But having a little bit of skin smoothing just leads to a more favorable image. And so what I like about Luminar is when I go to this AI skin enhancer and I just drag the amount up and it really like it's, it's just a slider. What it's doing is it's applying skin smoothing, but it's not removing the texture. Yeah. So he looks better, but he doesn't look fake. And I think that that's a huge deal. And also, as I zoom in again, it hasn't done anything to his mustache or his goatee. Yes. Okay. Because one, one of the terms that we used back in the day was airbrushing. Yes. And they would actually use an airbrush on skin and it would make it look very uniform and it would be very strange. Um, and a lot of the heavy duty retouching looks like that. Um, but this looks a lot better. Um, while, while you were talking, uh, I took a portrait I have here of someone and I applied the face light and wow, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, this was something where the lighting wasn't quite ideal um, where I took this photo um, and applying the face light, um, dark circles, let's just put a little bit 
I don't see much with the dark circles in this case. Eye enhancer, no, because he's, it's not a close-up. What are the others? Lip saturation, lip redness. Ah, because, yeah, no, that's, so you've got to be careful. There are a lot of things you can do that go too far, like this teeth whitening, mm -hmm. so people will look like, you know, Hollywood actors. Right. Um, but if if you're doing fashion, if you're doing wedding photos, you want to use these things. Yes, and actually what's nice about this is, let's say you you have several pictures of somebody because, you know, you've done a photo shoot. You can set these different controls. So you want your, like, I want skin enhancement to be at, at like 50 and eyes to be at, you know, 75 or what have you. Uh, you could then create a look, which is uh, Luminar's terminology for presets, and apply that look to the other photos. And what it will do is it's still going to use the technology of identifying the face in the photo. So if I were to do this the more traditional way, and I made uh, masked areas for his eyes to make them brighter, and I, I used layers to uh, you know adjust his, screen, his skin smoothing, and then I wanted to apply that to the next picture to save myself some time, right? Well, so batch processing in a way. Batch processing. It is. It, it's absolutely batch processing. The problem with the the old way is that the areas where I brightened his eyes, like he may have shifted or the camera may have moved yeah. between between yeah. images, and then you got to like match everything up. With this, Luminar is just going to say, "All right, I'm going to find the face." And then I'm going to increase the the eye enhancement, no matter where the eye is. So it can save you a huge amount of time. And again, I've done what I think is a fairly professional looking portrait edit on this photo, and it's only taken me a few minutes. And I think that's that's kind of the key in that, A, it didn't take me very much time. I didn't have to have a lot of special knowledge about how to use you know, all the various different techniques that if I were doing this for like a professional magazine, I would probably send it out to someone who really knew what they were doing. But th this is a perfectly acceptable shot. Well, I must say that I'm just, while you're talking, I'm doing another portrait. And just that face light tool alone is brilliant because yes. it really is just upping the exposure a little bit. Um, and if, you're, if your lighting wasn't ideal, that's really quite powerful to be able to do that. And it's also not really noticeable. I mean, noticeable in the sense that it's not drawing attention to itself. No, you're, not at all. You're unless taking pictures you, of unless people. Unless you exaggerate a lot. Exactly. And, you know, you want a little bit of attention to people's faces because that's what you're looking at. So being able to do this, I think, is is really helpful for anybody who's going to be shooting these types of photos. Um, you know, and it doesn't even have to be, a, you know, a formal portrait sitting. It can be your family in the backyard and there was a cloud and things got a little bit darker on one shot, but that's the one where they're all smiling, that kind of a thing. Uh, you can just do a little bit of retouching and not spend a whole lot of time, not spend a whole lot of effort, and get something that is either better than what you had started with or more in line with what you had uh, in your mind as you were shooting. But the big question. Oh, the big question. Does it work with cats? Um, yes, of course it works with cats. <laughs> uh, does you... it recognize cat oh. faces? I'm going to try it here with a photo I don't of think Titus the cat. I don't think it does. I don't think it does. Cameras, cameras can now no, it doesn't. Uh, pick out. When I when I go to the portrait enhancer, everything is dimmed, so I can't make any changes. Actually, actually, I'm gonna contradict myself. Photoshop Elements does have a mode that will recognize pets. Good. Yeah. Okay. Important. Y yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 I know that more and more cameras and more and more apps are, are able to do that. Uh, is it Sony that's got the new autofocus that recognizes pets as well? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, you know what, Jeff? We've been going a long time here. Should we move on to our snapshots? I think we should definitely move on to snapshots and thank everyone for their patience. My snapshot is photo related, but it's not really photo. So I just released a new book, Take Control of Your Apple Watch, and I updated that for Watch OS 7 and the, the new watches. And one of the features in Watch OS 7 is the ability to share watch faces with other people. 
And it's very slick. You set up a watch face with the complications that you want, complications being all the little different elements on the screen that give you different uh, information. Well, one of the watch faces that Apple lets you build is a photos face. And so you can specify that a selection of images or maybe an album in your photos library shows up as a watch face. So every time you lift your watch, you get a new image. Or if you have like maybe five or 10 images in a set, you can tap the screen and get another image. Well, you can share that watch face and it'll share the images too. It's really pretty slick. So that's my snapshot. Kirk, what do you have this week? Well, I don't have anything at all photo related. Um, I've got a TV series, and I guess the only link is that it's shot with a camera or hey, multiple cameras. Multiple so, cameras. <laughs> um, we were discussing before the show that we're both kind of running out of ideas. You know, there's no gear, no apps, or anything that we've been getting. Um, so, in order to have some entertainment lately, and, and I put this off when this first came out, this series, I saw the trailer and I thought, wow, this looks dumb. I'm not going to watch it. I started watching Ted Lasso on oh, Apple TV+. Yeah. Plus. And this is so funny. It really is. What, what I really like is it's an American who is a, a sort of mid-level football coach who gets hired to um, coach a soccer or, as they say in my country, football team, um, a mid-level team as well. He doesn't know anything about soccer, football when he gets there. He doesn't know much about England. And what I find, you know, humorous being an American in the UK is all of that cultural stuff. Um, th there are some weird things. There's, at one point, um, one of the characters played by Juno Temple um, says something about someone kind of walks up to her and she didn't expect them. And he, you scared a woman in a parking lot. Well, they don't say parking lot here. They say car park. So ah. this isn't entirely British English. There are a number of times I've noticed where there's Americanisms to make people understand things better. Um, but it's funny. Um, it's non-pretentious. It's the kind of series that's not trying to do too much. Um, it came out on Apple TV, what, in August, it looks like, was renewed for a second season five days after its premiere. So I guess these streaming services, they just have these metrics, how many people watch it in the first few days, and probably whether people binge a series or not. Although with Apple TV series, they release three episodes at once, and then the others come out weekly, I think. In any case, it's funny, it's light, um, it's made with cameras. It is absolutely a show that I thought would be Completely uninteresting to me because I don't really follow sports, uh, yeah, you know. And, me too. And it, it just sounded like like the sort of hokey fish out of water. And it is charming, and it's surprisingly uplifting, and it's funny, and it is also in some cases crass as heck. The language is yeah. is quite strong, but um, it's not strong in it, a it's, mean it's not way. offensive. It's not yeah. offensive. Yes, exactly. So Jeff, until next time. Until next time. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to Photoactive. You can find show notes, including any photos we discuss in this episode, at photoactive.co. That's photoactive.co. We couldn't afford the M. You can join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash photoactivecast. That's photoactivecast in one word. You can subscribe to Photoactive in your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts. See the links on our website. And think about leaving us a rating or review in iTunes or in your podcast app.